this is uh, open source innovation at its best, how, um, how local uh, responders made a difference in the COVID-19 crisis across the US. So if you're in the wrong place, now's a good time to swap, but otherwise we're really excited um, to spend the next 50 minutes with all of you. Um, I am gonna be moderating. My name is Molly Rubenstein. I work at Open Source Medical Supplies, um, but I'm really excited to have a group of speakers with me um, who I'm gonna ask to introduce themselves at this point. Just at the moment, kind of your name um, and uh, the project that you're working on. Um, right. I'll start. Uh, go for it, Ashley. Okay, my name's Ashley. Um, I started a group called Make Me PPE Bay Area, which was very focused on creating a local community effort within the San Francisco Bay Area to meet the needs of PPE. Um, and it's a conglomeration of volunteers, fabricators, medical consultants, a lot of people within the community with applicable skills that we were able to create a network and work together to produce, transport, and donate. Um, many different pieces of PPE that we were making. Awesome, thank you, Ashley. Ian, would you go next? Hi, Ian Charnas from Cleveland, Ohio. My background's engineering, and I help run uh, the Sears Thinkbox, which is a, a rather large makerspace and innovation center at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, during COVID, we've been involved in about uh, 10 different projects with our local hospitals, uh, including university hospitals. And we, I know we have David Sylvan on the line from UH. David, would you introduce yourself? Sure, thanks for the baton pass, Ian. I'm David Sylvan. I'm also in Cleveland, Ohio, and I lead an innovation and uh, venture capital platform for our hospital system. We are approximately 30,000 employees. We serve, uh, pro we see probably a million unique lives per year, uh, three, three and a half thousand beds or so. And um, our opportunity here was to really bring together a disparate set of people with differing backgrounds in order to solve for a, a very evident uh, pressing need. And uh, we partnered with Ian and others, and uh, we'll tell you that story. Thank you, David. And then Toby and Tessa, if you'd introduce yourselves. Yeah, so uh, my name is Toby. Uh, I'm the uh, Global Impact Data Lead at uh, Open Source Medical Supply. So I track a lot of makers all around the world, 55 countries, about 15 million pieces of PPE made around the globe. And uh, obviously a lot of that data is from within the United States. And I'm Tessa Byford. I'm a social impact producer. I work alongside Tobias on some of the data counting and the tally counting and going through um, what's being made, but also a producer of the maker video that came out where we curated a lot of footage from all over the world and especially the United States um, and sort of showcased their work. And we've brought all of these, my name, sorry, again, is Molly Rubenstein. I work with um, Toby at Open Source Medical Supplies. We're an initiative that started in March to help organize, coordinate, and inform the local makers and manufacturers who were working to create useful, safe medical devices and community supplies um, to prevent and uh, treat the virus. And one of the things we've been focusing on is this work that Toby has done around aggregating and telling the story of what these local making and manufacturing efforts have been able to accomplish. So we're really excited to have all of these people here today to share with you both some sense of the scale of what this effort has been able to do and also some of the details of what allowed those efforts to be successful. Um, what are some of the things that make it really hard to do this work? Um, what are some of the things that could be helpful to these local efforts to help make them succeed and where we see this going in the future? Um, the session is being recorded and it will be available afterwards as will slides and materials that get shared during the session. I will encourage you if you have questions as we go along, it's a short session, we have to cut off right at um, 2.50 Eastern. Um, so we have a, a section for discussion questions towards the end. So if you drop questions into the chat, I'll be able to kind of farm those out to our uh, panelists when we get to the right time. Um, what I would like to start with is more of a conversation about this question of scale, the scope of what these efforts have been able to accomplish, specifically in the US. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, to share some visualizations that uh, Toby and Tessa have been working on um, on this effort in the US.
So Toby and Tessa, question for you, kind of what is the scope of, at least from the perspective you've been able to access or the conversations you've had, of what local makers and manufacturers have been able to accomplish in the US? And what are some of the kind of patterns and trends you've seen in that work? Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, when you look at this chart, I, I hope that it's uh, telling the story to some degree on a, on a quantity and on a scale level, right? So over the last three months around about makers all over the US have made around 7.5 million pieces of PPE and other medical supplies in 45 different categories. Um, and of course, the predominant one by far is face shields. Uh, they're the easiest to automate. And you can see very much how in the first four weeks, there's a very, very quick ramp up and then there's sort of a tapering off. Um, and this is a very interesting sort of like overall large scale effect that we've seen, you know, that there's very similar patterns all over the world um, in different countries. Uh, and specifically in the US, the, the curve is very well defined because we have a lot of data and because a lot of people in the US were willing to share their production data. Um, Tessa, maybe you can talk a little bit about the reasons that we found why it tapered off over time. Yeah, so the beginning we were more sort of Oops, I think you guys may have frozen. In a crisis mode where a lot of information, are we back? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So at the beginning, um, you'll see around March uh, 28th, there were, um, we were sort of more in a crisis mode where a lot of information was coming in. So people were sort of setting up their groups. They were sort of figuring out where um, they could put their, their effort into, into what. Um, and then you can go ahead and see that um, about mid-April, production really started ramping up for all of the groups. And also they were able to get more information of what was needed. Um, and then sort of it went the other way where people needed less things when it hit around May or they weren't communi or the communication wasn't really working where People didn't know where the hospital, what hospitals needed, or they needed to sort of re, revamp um, production and figure out what the hospitals needed. Um, so we basically were seeing that kind of curve that Toby was talking about where people were trying to set up, then a well-oiled machine happened, and then they're trying to set up again because they're trying to figure out where things are needed and what they need to do. Um, do you feel like we can talk more about the challenges that those local communities were facing or reasons yeah. for that shift uh, a little bit later in the session okay okay yeah. cool and i think one one other very important thing for scale is the question of how much it can be automated right so mm -hmm. you can see very specifically with face shields a lot of automation can happen injection molding 3d printing whereas with cloth masks it takes a lot more manual labor but at the height um you know basically in early may um, people made hundreds of thousands of face masks and face shields all over the country. Brilliant. Thank you. <clears throat> Ashley, I want to go on to you and just talk a little bit about the scale of production that you guys uh, experienced for, um, oops, sorry. And we can come back to this at Make Me PPE Bay Area. Um, sure. you, sorry. Do you want to introduce this at all? Um, well, I just wanted to point out that we are, since we're such a community localized response, it was more than just um, fabricators or innovators, but a lot of hobbyists as well. And a lot of volunteers who didn't necessarily have like sewing skills or fabrication skills. And so in setting up an entire production pipeline, a lot of what we did was get folks who knew how to create um, you know, these tables that are, you know, die cutting tables. And then we got volunteers from the community who were like, I can't sew, I can't, I don't have a 3D printer, but how can I help? So it became a very um, interesting community effort in that we got people involved in more than just making, but in a lot of the logistical coordination of all of it. Um, so we created an entire production pipeline that we were able to scale up to producing um, up to 2,500 masks in a week. To date, we've produced over 30,000 units of PPE, 25,000 of which were masks. Um, and in partnering with sister groups that were making face shields or small businesses and even local manufacturers that were pivoting to produce PPE, we were able to help distribute. And it was very much um, a network of a variety of different kinds of makers coming from backgrounds from hobbyists to manufacturers and we all together 
created this thing together that we were able to provide for so many folks in the community. And I'm curious, do you have a sense um, or data available around the geographic scope of kind of how many uh, households or municipalities or kind of where those 30,000 units of PPE went? Um, so we are a group local to the Bay Area. I would say from start to finish, we've had probably around 500 volunteers um, from the people actually creating PPE, transporting it, helping us donate it. Um, and coordinating it to donate to about 120 facilities throughout the Bay Area. Originally, the scope of need was a lot of medical facilities, but as state mask mandates came out, it we've since pivoted and are serving a lot more community organizations, homeless shelters, food banks, um, you know, low-income housing projects, things like that. Anyone that we can support right now during this time. So the scope of need has changed, but I would say that the volunteer um, force of production is still pretty strong. I mean, even last week we got out about 2,200 masks. So it's okay. still happening, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ashley. Um, so Ian and David, um, I can stop my share here. Would you tell us a little bit more about your collaborative effort um, and feel free to, to share materials and talking a little bit about kind of what you were setting out to accomplish and, and the scope of what you've been able to accomplish so far. Sure. Sure. David, yeah, can I share to... something? Yeah. Or do you want Please to go, go first? Ahead. Go for it. Okay. Uh, Molly, I'm going to share my screen. Go for it. <clears throat> um, so one of the uh, projects we got involved with at uh, Thinkbox was a uh, project. And I thought people might enjoy seeing um, a visual of what that looks like at, at manufacturing scale. So this is a, a two die injection mold machine that's making the headbands. Uh, many of you might have seen the Prusa face shield design. Uh, we started with that and then the design had to be modified significantly so that it could be uh, injection molded. We've made about 125, 150,000 of those. And here is a, a die stamping machine, die cutting machine uh, that's making the clear shield part. Uh, so at a maker scale, this might be laser cut or it might be cut with scissors and a paper punch. Um, but this is a, a, a clicker die, an automated clicker die. There's machines that are even faster than this that are called uh, roller dies. Uh, but just depending on the, uh, the scale of the manufacturing uh, process that you went with, here's a, a hand operated clicker die uh, that produces the elastomeric face shields. Uh, just to give people a sense of what this looks like at scale, um, I thought that might be uh, that might be pretty pretty interesting. We did see the same uh, peak that uh, Tessa and Tobias saw, and I, I think it. Uh, I, I didn't make a nice graph like them. That looks really fantastic, but I think that illustrates that the demand tracked relatively well with um, the with the need. Our, we saw peak COVID deaths in the U.S. Uh, the third week of April. And uh, after that, you would still see quite a lot of cases. Um, I think their, uh, their graph peaked the, the week right after that, where you're still seeing a lot of people in the hospital. Uh, David, why don't you add to that? Sure, so we were the unmet need. We were the other side of the table, Molly. Um, when stats first began to get published, it became, to be, it became very unclear to us initially what the magnitude was going to be. Shockingly for most of us, what did become clear was that there was a peer supply and demand imbalance. We knew what we had in inventory. We were basing usage on uh, projected numbers and became very clear that we were going to be in dire straits pretty soon. Um, our ability to tap into offshore pipelines had dried up. Our traditional US and, US and domestic based supply chain was, was almost non-existent. So this no longer became a buy decision. This had to become a, a make build, a design build decision. Fortunate in the, in the geography where we currently reside that we had close connections with the likes of Ian and then close connections candidly with some very large corporates who uh, were very willing to pivot their production facilities towards our needs. In terms of scale, um, over course of, Ian, you'll correct me, literally less than a week, we went from schematics to actually getting product into clinicians' hands for, uh, for testing and reverting uh, to beginning scale production in less than a week. And within three weeks of that period, 
our production partner, Eaton Corporation, had produced a million face shields, became the standard of the this, um, accepted standard product of use for the state of Ohio in its emergency response for all hospitals. So tremendous collaboration and uh, only happened because there was this sort of willingness to come together uh, at, at short notice. Thank you. Um, if we've rushed through the introductions a bit, it's because what I'm really excited about is learning a bit more of what has been most challenging about this work. You know, you've all been able to accomplish incredible things over the course of, you know, three months. Um, so wanting to hear a little bit more of, you know, what was hardest about that? Um, and what did you do in order to overcome those challenges and actually manage to be successful? Um, so Ashley, I'm wondering if we could start with you again. Sure. Um, I think when it first began and the need became very apparent, there were a lot of different people coming from a lot of different angles. Um, certain people were trying to make workforce development programs and there were different models of, you know, produce a certain number of masks and then you have to sell a certain number to, you know, have enough financial resources to continue to produce more and then you could donate only you know, the following number. On top of that, we had a lot of like supply chain and raw materials issues because all the fabric stores were closed and all the hobbyists, you know, couldn't get access to materials. So people were coming at it from all different angles and able to donate time, able to donate different resources. So in doing that, we actually were able to create a production network from the ground up. I mean, it started with someone volunteering a warehouse and then people volunteering time to show up and cut fabric and then people volunteering to sew the fabric into masks and then people um, an amazing local motorcycle group is able to help us donate all those things so it really was the unique um, skill set that each person was able to donate and continues to be able to donate um, that was you know able to help us go from beginning to where we are now. Um, there were a lot of different groups that also popped up, whether, you know, our group covers the entire San Francisco Bay Area, but there were groups even more specific to certain counties in the Bay Area. So in doing that, we got to work together and sort of offload, you know, everything in San Francisco County can kind of partner with this group or Santa Clara County and sort of getting to work together to fulfill need in a way that was avoiding duplication, optimizing, you know, our own work processes and making sure that everyone's time was using, was being used, um, you know, to its fullest potential. And I'm, I'm curious, um, you also talked about special, so you're talking about specialization of your organization as compared to other organizations in the area. You also talked about specialization of roles within your own production line and operations in order to help make sure that everybody had a role that fit their own skill set. That's a really hard thing to do with a group of volunteers. I'm curious kind of how did you go about figuring out where to put everyone and actually putting them and managing them in that process? Um, in a lot, a few friends have asked me that, like how I've done this thing where I organized, you know, and engaged a vast network of community folks. And to be honest, it just kind of happened. Like all these volunteers stood up and said, I can drive. I have access to a makerspace. I have access to this. These are the materials I have. Someone reached out and said, there's a woman in Sacramento who has a whole warehouse full of fabric. And the next day we were driving a 16 foot box truck up to Sacramento to empty out her warehouse full of fabric. You know, like everyone stood up and said, these are the skills I have, this is the resource that I'm willing to donate, and this is the way that I can engage and move this moment forward. That's incredible. And we've seen that kind of volunteerism and kind of people's willingness to be forthcoming um, with what they can offer to the effort across uh, the whole uh, country and, and the global effort. I'm curious, do you have a sense, were there particular channels for getting information out that kind of brought you that volunteer um, contribution, you know, or, or particular strategies you had for engaging with people or finding people? Um, I am not 
really a huge member of the maker community myself. I'm actually a member of the Broadway community. So my skill as a young person was social media. I just made a Facebook group. I found other Facebook groups that were for quilting, for sewing. We connected, you know, I reached out to anyone in the network that would have the applicable skills to what we're trying to accomplish. So a lot of you know, I'm a theater person. I thought about all the theater companies in the Bay Area that I grew up performing at, all these, you know, wardrobe supervisors and technicians and people who have these skills were all of a sudden out of work and looking for a way to help. So in finding ways to infiltrate that community, the educational community, like Fashion Institute of Technology, the Academy of Art has a fashion program. We were connecting with all these different um, groups that were already in place that had certain infrastructures and, you know, an established system of roles. We even found like local manufacturers, like local apparel manufacturers, you know, like activating different networks that were already in place so that we weren't building every bit of infrastructure from the ground up and we were sort of coordinating with different um, structures that were already there. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So Ian and David, um, can you also share a little bit, what were some of the biggest challenges that you guys faced in embarking on this collaboration? And then what were some of the ways that you overcame those challenges? Sure, I'll, I'll give a quick answer and then pass to David. We, um, the, in addition to everything Ashley just said, because that's spot on, um, a big challenge we faced was uh, the sort of fire hose of information. In March, we started seeing um, hundreds of new projects almost every single day from intubation boxes to helmet-based helmet -based ventilators. University of Illinois put out a um, open source design for an emergency uh, invasive ventilator unit. Uh, MIT had a project and, and still does called EVA. It was just left and right, this barrage of new projects and trying to choose which ones to work on uh, was a big challenge. And, and part of that, you wanna know, what's the one I should be working on? And so naturally our, our design thinking uh, background led us to say, well, talk to the end users, talk to the clinicians. I can't speak with them directly. I don't have those relationships built up, but that's when we reached out to the innovation teams at our, our local hospitals. Uh, and David heads one of those innovation teams. So maybe he can speak about how he, how he talked to those end users. Sure, happy to, Ian. And I think there was a meeting of the minds. We, we are also a platform that is based on uh, a bunch of design disciplines, specifically human-centered design. And so uh, the challenge that we anticipated that fortunately didn't rear its head was the bringing together of all of these disparate disciplines into a singular focus. And, you know, Ian and I would be on, the, on calls at uh, 10, 11 p.m. and we'd have surgeons on the call with us. Um, for better or for worse, a lot of the uh, elective procedures had been stalled, which meant that there were um, uh, people nowhere near the top of their license who were leaning into this opportunity because they had the, the, the user's lens, the, the user view. Um, for us, the primary challenge, however, was to divorce ourselves from the emotional impact. Um, working within a provider space, um, we knew of, we know the people who were getting ill. We knew the people who were succumbing. We knew many of the patients. And so for us, it was a case of taking some really deep breaths and stepping back to say, we know what we can do to address this problem. We're gonna have to prioritize on the basis of a um, waterfall of defenses, if you will, what will run out first. And if we don't address that specific skew, what impact might that have in terms of safety, both safety for the patient as well as the provider. So once we, uh, once we caught our breaths and we managed to force the, the, the emotional impact of this out of the conversation, um, we, we began to lean on the likes of Ian and his colleagues to be the, the ears to the ground with regard to what might be out there from an open source perspective that could be most readily viable. Um, there were some very sophisticated designs out there. The FDA had not yet put themselves in a position where they were approving for emergency use some of these very, very complicated products. And so for us, it was a case of, could we retrofit uh, full face scuba masks? Could we reverse engineer a CPAP machine into a, a ventilator of last resort? Uh, and the list goes on. We didn't have the answers to those questions. So uh, it was the partnership with Ian and his colleagues that managed to, uh, to get us to those endpoints. 
And beyond just that ability to partner with one another, what were other, you know, and I guess the, using the, the design methodology to just drive decision making, were there other techniques that you used specifically um, to move the process along or keep people engaged? I know that one of the challenges has been that, you know, of course it's so important to involve the medical practitioners, but their availability and ability to participate publicly in these innovation processes is, is, can be compromised and sometimes that can't be predictable. Um, so I'm curious, can you speak a little bit more to that? Sure. You know, very early on, we, we sat down with our legal teams and uh, they made it clear to us that they were going to remove all hindrances and barriers to, to uh, putting us in a position to save lives. Almost a, a, an attitude of, if we find ourselves in a situation where we have to ask forgiveness, but we save some lives, let's, 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 let's force ourselves down, down that path. Um, it really, really changed the manner in which the organization began to coalesce around the notions of proof of concepts and piloting and projects. Ordinarily, it would take me six to eight months to go from here is a pitch deck to here is a pilot project within the, within the clinical workflow. Um, Ian can attest to the fact that we put things into production within literally days, and that was getting through contracting and legal, all of the design iterations, and of course, the, the fabricating and the production. So um, I think this uh, mission-focused willingness to all shed egos and come together to get to a, an endpoint or get to a failure as quickly as possible, I think is what drove the, uh, the success. And I can add just a tiny bit onto uh, what David said, because I totally agree. The, um, I I'm envious of, um, of the uh, open source medical supplies group and what Ashley has been able to be able to do uh, in that you're able to be so incredibly nimble. Uh, like David mentioned, normally it would take us many months, if not years, before we could begin a collaboration because we'd first have to get legal teams approval just to talk, lest we uh, give out any secret intellectual property that, that could be used to make profit. Uh, but what we, uh, a success that we had was uh, to get um, the uh, agreement with our legal teams to let us proceed in parallel uh, with their work. Normally, we have to wait until their work's finished before we can start those meetings. But they said, I'm good faith. We're going to let you uh, work together and uh, get things out the door. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to kind of come and pick cleanup. Usually, it happens the other way around. Um, so I, I'm really, really happy with our legal teams for seeing that these are unusual times and they call for unusual answers. Yeah, and I can speak from my experience. Um, in another part of my life, I work out of MIT. Um, and so seeing, you know, how can academic institutions actually introduce some more than their traditional amount of flexibility in order to make change happen during a time of crisis. Um, it's, it's been really interesting to see how institutions have or have not been able to make those adaptations over the course of the last few months. So Toby and Tessa, um, I'm curious, you know, from your work looking at the big picture, are there trends that you've seen as far as the types of challenges that local groups have faced and the types of successes they've seen and the things that have enabled those successes? Yeah, um, uh, maybe I'll just start from the, from the data perspective, right? So data has this canary in the coal mine kind of characteristic, right? Because everybody's working within their sphere of awareness, um, but by centralizing and collecting the data on say production, right? Even just something as benign as saying, okay, how much did you make this week? And you aggregate all of the data weekly throughout the entire United States. You know, at some point we suddenly see that there's a drop, right? And it's been going up and up and up and up every week, but suddenly there's a drop. And so immediately once there was a drop, we're like, okay, something might be not right. You know, it, it might be that we just maxed out capability, but then you would kind of see a flat line but instead we saw a drop, so we're like, okay, what's going on? And so within less than a week, we were able to basically address makers all over the world and ask, you know, what has changed? Um, and that is very important for the individual maker groups because everybody oftentimes thinks that, you know, they're a unique case, but there's certain larger trends. Um, and maybe Tessa, you can talk a little bit about the trends that kind of emerged out of that questionnaire. Yeah, so my perspective from everything, I think I'm sort of in the same boat as Ashley, where I'm I'm not really from the maker community, but as a filmmaker and making this documentary, I talk to a lot of 
the makers and the different leaders of each group. And the conversation sort of seemed similar. It was, there was a pattern. There was a, um, we have our heads down and we're like working and working and working and there, and there might be some burnout or we don't really know where to send everything now. We need to build those connections. And so I think a lot of the makers um, felt that they need to build groups and really have somebody that, you know, keeps data data or really have somebody who has those connections, have a grant writer on board. Um, yeah, so I think those sort of trends of like, how do we build this group around this one thing and really um, be able to make something sustainable, that was like a big trend in our conversation of how they'll be able to do that. But I think a lot, um, the makers that we're talking with right now, I think you guys aren't giving yourselves the credit of being scrappy. I think that's like a big character of makers that I saw when I was talking to everyone is that they're all trying to figure it out. Everyone, no one's like, I can't do it or I don't know how to do it. Everyone's like, we don't know how to do it, but we're going to figure it out. So I think that's really what led to, you know, for seven plus million units of PPE that we counted. Just in the U.S. alone. Yeah. 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 I, um, I just want to comment. We've been having conversations within the maker community about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And one of the themes that has come up is the fact that, you know, who thinks of themselves as a maker or not a maker, or how do we even define who a maker is? And I, you know, Dorothy's making a point from some of these conversations, which is that who can be a maker isn't necessarily defined by who participates in a space that has a 3D printer. Um, and that there are, you know, many people in the world. And in fact, one might argue that everyone on some level has the capacity to be a person who creates based on that initiative, that scrappiness, that willingness to like see a problem or an opportunity to create change and then creates that change. Whether that's physical change, it's digital change, or it's, you know, service change, system change. So just want to highlight that um, from the conversation going on in the chat. I, I wanted to ask, you know, the framing of Capitol Hill Maker Fair in particular is thinking about, you know, what's the relationship between maker efforts and the structural institutions like local government um, that we interact with. And so I'm curious, and this might be somewhat speculative or that you might have concrete experiences um, as part of your process that you can speak to, but are there types of supports and structures or limitations that were uh, related to local government that you interacted with as part of your process? Or were there things that you kind of wished your local government might do um, that could have helped you um, if it had been available? Or things that you saw happening in other municipalities that you wished were happening um, that you could interact with as part of your process locally? And I'd be curious also if other people have examples of that that you wanna drop in the chat. This would be a, a great question to open up to the group. You know, I'll take a quick run at that, Molly. I, um, the notion of government helpful, those two words usually don't, don't uh, co-reside. Um, I think in our situation, we had a unique opportunity in that both local, regional, and state government initially got out of the way, but did uh, avail us of uh, funding, uh, not consequential at the end of the day, and certainly not sufficient to, to fill the gap. Um, we made the determination that we think about how we were going to afford what we had to do uh, at some other point in time. But I think the best thing governments, the, the government structures in our jurisdiction did for us was allow us to be agile because they certainly couldn't be. Um, and um, I know that wasn't the experience for many of, of my colleagues, our colleagues around the country. Um, that would be my comment with regards to, to that sort of coalescence. I actually wanted to mention in talking to other um, mask making groups, I saw a lot of like national organizations popping up very quickly, but not a lot of local ones, which was sort of how we centered the focus around our group. But I spoke to someone who worked on the Colorado mask project and because they had a push from the governor on a state level to get local manufacturers, small businesses, and hobbyists all working out of the same database, they were able to make a singular platform that was very easy for people to find, um, folks that needed PPE, 
um, whether they were schools or small businesses or large businesses or organizations, they all had a, a place within the state that was led by the state and you know brought everyone together so there wasn't a duplication of efforts. We tried to sort of do that within the San Francisco Bay Area and of course the population of Colorado is massively different from California and even northern versus southern California is very different. But I mean, I remember having a conversation with someone at the um, in-kind donations branch in the state of San Francisco. And I said, is this something we could do? Is this something that we can all be on the same page about and work off of one database and you know, provide for our community that way? And she was like, the red tape that would be in place even to activate the city disaster service workers to learn how to sew and produce the vital material needed at this time. There's so much red tape that it's, it's not a conversation that's going to happen and find, you know, resolve in any sort of timely manner. So I just wish that there was a little bit more local leadership sponsorship um, from the government that could have helped a community movement like this. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. Um, Toby and Tessa, I'm curious, you guys, you ha may have something else to say, but I also want to introduce um, that you've been working on a series of uh, national case studies, um, including other nations that are not the US. And so in addition to my previous question, just are there lessons that we in the US could learn from how governments are getting involved in the coordination of these response efforts in other parts of the world? Um, yeah, so basically, you know, we, we have data not just from the United States, but really from 55 countries around the world that we've been working on for the last three months. And so um, part of the effort has definitely been this sort of national case study kind of setup where we study how has how have different countries reacted and how have the maker movements within those countries reacted. And there is actually a good number, a good number of uh, examples of local government supporting the makers in many different localities around the world. Uh, I would say the general trend is the governments are doing their thing while the makers are doing their own thing because the governments just don't see enough of a uh, of a fit or an ability. But then there's certain like prime examples, you know, where an entire uh, like government says, okay, we'll give you so much money, we'll give you resources, we'll give you materials. Uh, the Red Cross is going to help you transport stuff. We'll activate the military to help you distribute things to hospitals. Um, France, for example, has had a lot of military support. Spain has had a lot of military support for makers. You know, and then the, the makers and the military work directly together. And the government sort of working in the middle. And it's rarely ever the national government, usually always the local ones. Um, but yeah, there, there's some amazing stories from around the world. And even from within the US, like uh, Colorado is a great example, you know, where the state really stepped in and said, you know, we want to one protect the makers uh, so that they don't get exploited um, and also uh, help the makers match with uh, with hospitals and, and with need. Um, that's the of other international or national stories. Um, I would say that mm, the stories that I've been been talking about or is mostly in Afghanistan where there was a lot of support. Um, that was more support with, um, I would say, delivery. Um, as for the guidelines of what to make, I think that they're a little bit trying to figure it out on their own because there are, there's different, um, I would say, um, guide, guidelines of what is appropriate to use in hospitals and stuff, but as in for delivery to the um, I would say inner city communities, they are helping out with that, but it just depends. Yeah. Yeah. But it, generally there's an amazing amount of collaboration between so many different sectors. Like this community is as diverse as it gets. Mm -hmm. The people, for example, in Hungary, kind of like uh, Ian, you know, the die cutting setup that you showed, extremely industrial and very fast uh, and extremely high volume, therefore also requiring a certain amount of capital to raise, right? They had worked basically with as many groups around them as possible to pool money then purchase basically or purchase access to the supply line and then just made hundreds of thousands of face shields. And they were all just regular people working on Star Wars movies and building backdrops for these US film productions. And when everything shut down, they said, you know what, we're actually in the motion picture industry, but we could make face shields. And they just did it. I can chime in if there's still time with a couple things. Go ahead. Uh, I know we're, we're running short. Um, at the federal level, a few things I liked uh, that I saw the CDC had a um, pandemic playbook that they made some years ago, and it compiled the results of thousands, literally thousands, 
of scientific studies from epidemiology, from uh, you name it, infectious control, to look at what is the best plan for when a big pandemic hits. And aren't we so fortunate that they put that playbook together before this pandemic hit? So here in Ohio, we're the 12th most populous state in the US uh, by numbers. We followed that playbook. Uh, Dr. Amy Acton was our, uh, until we lost her after people protested her, very sad. Um, we followed that and we were doing very good. We were in the bottom 10 of actual uh, cases uh, in, until we lost uh, Dr. Amy Acton, she decided to retire. Um, but kudos to the CDC for putting that together and to the FDA, some of the projects that each of us have been able to move forward on quickly um, are, are the result of the FDA saying for certain things or uh, some kinds of face masks for some kinds of uh, face mask sterilizing chambers. We are not going to um, come after you if you produce these devices, even if they don't <clears throat> have pre-market authorization, if they're not FDA approved. They did that uh, in a series of letters and only for particular devices um, where they saw that this would, the, the need would be better than the, the benefit would be better than the potential uh, downsides to it. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy with that. And I'm, I'm curious to see if that's something we can replicate ever outside of the uh, pandemic. Yeah, and I actually want to build straight off of that, the last two comments, because I think there were two things that keep coming up um, as having been unusual during this time and has having been critically important for success during this time of crisis. And I think one of the big questions that we're all trying to figure out is how do those things continue once the sense of urgency passes? And those two are, first of all, collaboration between non-traditional partners. So either people who are accustomed to, who are working in the same industries, but are accustomed to competing with each other. And I think that happens just as much in the nonprofit world as it does in the for-profit world. Um, and then also this relaxation of intensity of, uh, or the inflexibility of procedure and bureaucracy in order to get innovation to happen. So I'm curious if any of you have thoughts on, you know, Beyond just the impulse of the crisis itself, what are ways that you could imagine us continuing to build on that, those starting points, both around keeping these collaborations and this inclination towards collaboration uh, active and, and functional and, and vibrant, and also how to uh, promote the flexibility and, and nimbleness that has been so important during this time um, once this sense of urgency has passed? Well, and again, yeah, I welcome any comments um, or uh, contributions from the audience as well. Molly, I think we've started to do this already. I think the pace with we came together to do things is probably neither sustainable nor healthy. But the fear that we all have is that we'll somehow revert back to business as usual February uh, of this year. And I think those who allow that to happen are doomed to fail for a whole host of reasons because business models have changed around us, have been forced those changes have been forced upon us. To give, to underscore that slightly, we have already begun to forge formal relationships with organizations mm. and, and entities outside of our healthcare system. Um, entities that came together with us uh, only a couple of three months ago. And the desire was, was, um, was bolstered by the fact that we can't allow ourselves to now stop speaking is because the need no longer exists. And, We've entered into co-development and co-production agreements with various organizations. It became increasingly clear to me again that many, many other industries have already solved for the problems that healthcare still grapples with. It's a very broken business model. And so our receptivity to um, um, uh, sh shed the blinkers, if you will, with regard to how we might source opportunity from outside of our domain, uh, we're beginning to formalize those relationships. And in fact, you know, part of my role is to, is to uh, impact cultural change within our organization. Um, we have innovation competitions where we have now formally contracted with Thinkbox, Ian's organization, to actually send awardees to Ian so that they can begin to fabricate prototypes for, uh, for, for these innovation competitions. It's small, it's symbolic, but those are the types of things that will, uh, be, uh, that will be sustainable beyond this, uh, this epidemic. At least that's my hope. I wanted to speak to the fact that, I mean, I am not in the business of production pipelines and necessarily like fabrication innovation, but we 
when we were talking about mask making and looking at fabrication consultants and medical consultants on what's the most effective way to create something using the least amount of material at the fastest, you know, in the fastest timeline, we're also seeing like, even if we don't get it totally, totally right or as effective as it could be, the idea that we're creating the culture of mask wearing or the culture of preventative, you know, response to things like a global pandemic is in itself an innovation in what the maker community brings to society as a whole. So because we're innovators, because we are thinking ahead of the curve in, you know, whether it's offensive or defensive, we're creating a culture of response um, within our own communities that I think is going to be helpful in hopefully avoiding the next one. Um, maybe one one uh, thing that I think is very important for uh, OSMS um, is the sharing of insights, right? Because in the beginning, everybody was running trial and error, but now it's three months down the line and we have so many insights from all around the world on what worked, what didn't work. And, you know, whatever works say, in Ohio for Ian might not work in Afghanistan. So um, the ability to share these playbooks, like Ian mentioned, you know, the CDC put together a culmination of all these different experiences through uh, peer-reviewed papers and then created a sort of playbook for people to follow. The same thing as what we're doing at uh, OSMS, right? So there's, an, uh, there's a local response guide that helps people stand up their own organizations in other countries with, with the insights that we learn from all the people that have stood them up so far. Uh, the, um, that's already available. And then there's the national response studies that are going to come online in the next week or so, um, which are going to showcase how can you actually stand up a national scale kind of response, you know, when all these smaller groups coagulate. And so I think a very big part of going from the sprint to the marathon, which I think a lot of us have accidentally slipped into, is sharing as many of the insights as possible and sharing awareness all, all around with the media, with whatever abilities that we have with giving each other a sort of leg up and saying, look, we've gone through this before. You don't have to try again, starting everything from scratch. Yeah, reinventing the wheel. Yeah. yeah. And I think something that we're working on with Dorothy and some of the other leaders in this movement is how do we make sure that in that information sharing, we're also not even just dependent on what's within our own reach, but how can we partner with other leaders to both aggregate those best practices from the largest spread and get them, you know, like kind of lever ourselves into a position where we can get those in front of audiences where they can make a difference, so that we can really tell the story of what's happened and what we've all learned um, to see if that can help to promote these kind of long standing changes in our society more broadly um, that we're all learning are possible because of this crisis and that we want to see continue. So I'm curious, we're, we're just coming up on time. Um, for any of the panelists, um, if you have any last, I don't know, reflections on your experiences over the last three months or pieces of advice uh, for others engaging in this work and move, transitioning from this um, sprint to the marathon um, or kind of calls to action for our uh, national community um, as you move forward, what are you thinking about as, uh, as far as the next step, the future? Molly, we're thinking about resiliency and mental health. I think we've, uh, we've reverted from using the term uh, uh, social distancing to, to really underscoring physical distancing because we need to stay close socially. Um, I think organizations and communities need to come together to ensure that their constituents are healthy, um, that their needs, uh, uh, perhaps unrecognized needs are being addressed. Um, we have uh, entire swaths of our population who are in desperate, desperate trouble right now. Um, the, the end point seems to continue to be receding into the future. So I think looking out for each other would be the, um, is, is becoming paramount from our organization's perspective, the, the mental health and the resiliency piece. Thank you, David. Uh, I'll chime in. Um, I, uh, on the engineering side, we're going to keep plugging away. That's what we do. I think the next big, big challenge uh, that we're facing really right now is something that Ashley um, harped on earlier, which is the cultural uh, normative uh, making, <laughs> if we will. Um, we, need a, we need a culture where ma mask wearing is normal, not shaking hands is now normal. And that's an area where I think uh, it, it's really great that we have folks from uh, Broadway and, uh, and Hollywood together here represented on this panel. 
um, for uh, Ashley at Broadway and, and uh, Tessa with filmmaking, um, because I think that's the big thing. There's a normalizing power that uh, TV, movies, uh, videos you see on YouTube has, and, and that power, if, if used responsibly, can, uh, can help us all. I think also the idea, um, the normative idea of the way that ideas come to fruition and how they're implemented either in innovation or entrepreneurship. I mean, this experience has been eye-opening for me to see the different collaboration that happens and the best idea wins rather than the idea with the most funding or the largest, you know, um, check behind it. So this spirit of the projects that we've all created in terms of collaborating with each other, opening up channels of communication, as you mentioned, like working with your competitor, making something better because we're doing it together and it's in the spirit of innovation and advancing something for the greater whole. I mean, I think that is hopefully that we take something from this and continue to do that into the future. Um, so for me, I think, you know, all of you who are, uh, listening and I think you're doing the right thing. You're getting as much information as possible and you're connecting with other people and you're sharing insights and you're learning things. I think this is the most important thing also going forward is sharing insights and learning from each other and being as transparent as we can afford to be. Um, because this is the only way that we'll ever have a good picture of the crisis as it develops and as it keeps going and as it changes. Um, and um, yeah, so I think sharing of information and sharing of insights is uh, key. Yeah, and, and as a, a filmmaker, I would be, don't be afraid to document everything that you're doing. Um, like Toby said earlier, um, to try not to reinvent the wheel every single time. So later on, you can just go back and you can see everything that you did, whether that's creating guidelines um, for different products or even creating social media, um, um, and just making sure that there's something there that lives and it can and so people can continue to see it And I think one of the big things for open source medical supplies is also how do we think about equity when it comes to open health? Um, and how can we make sure that both the kind of business opportunities that come with the changing world? Um, and the you know social needs that are emerging because of this pandemic are addressed in an equitable and inclusive fashion and that's something that we're also working really closely with dorothy and nation of makers to try to do in our next stage of strategy well that brings us we're just a couple of minutes over uh, to the end of our session um it was so great um to have all of you here with us today um, we will be sending out information about this session and links to information about each one of these organizations and efforts um, and Dorothy can uh, just give a quick reminder about what comes next. Yes, yeah, so hopefully people are not growing, growing too fatigued. It's a little hard with the back-to-back -back panels. I know we tried to leave a little bit of time for bio breaks, but our next panel is Museums and Libraries, ex Community Responders in Times of Crisis. We're really excited to have uh, a panel of individuals that are funded and supported by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which includes, again, museums and libraries. Um, so hopefully you'll join us. I'll go back into that sketch, uh, you know, schedule, and then you can click on that Zoom link to bring you there. I just want to say thank you to everyone on this panel. It's been a really amazing panel. And thank you also to Molly for moderating uh, today. And, and a huge thank you to your video. <laughs> um, and a huge thank you to Nation of Makers and the Capitol Hill Maker Fair for having us all. Have a great rest of your day.